Okay, so um, the introduction to variant analysis. So we, of course, we will start very relatively low level, really with the, with the beginning, uh, probably some refreshment from, uh, well, for your, for your introductory course at university, maybe in genetics. And uh, from there on, of course, it will be uh, become uh, more more specific to, to next generation sequencing. So why uh, would you study variants? Uh, in general, uh, there are usually uh, two, two reasons uh, for that. Um, typically, they also uh, are related to each other. But one of them is to find causes for phenotypic uh, variation. And then, of course, mainly phenotypic variation that is caused by um, by 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 variants in in the DNA, uh, so inherited phenotypic uh, variation, and uh, for example, one thing you can do is uh, do a genome wide association study. So you measure phenotypes uh, in in a population, and you also do a variant analysis on, for example, the whole genome or whole exome. Of uh, start uh, of that species, and then you try to find association between presence and absence of variants and and the phenotypes. And they find correlations between a variant and a phenotype. And if you are lucky, or if you uh, have a good coverage of your entire genome, you might actually find the the causal variant. Second, and that's. Again, also related to that, um, and that's mainly an application in, for example, ecology, is to, to understand relatedness between individuals, between species, um, and, and to, uh, for example, answer questions about evolution, evolution or, or other, uh, or ecological, uh, ecological questions. So, for example, with parent analysis, you can make such a nice uh, species tree, polygenetic tree. So uh, variation uh, has to come from, from somewhere. And um, usually, or actually always, a variation in, uh, in the DNA is caused by a mutation. And that mutation well, has been an event uh, that at some point occurred and then was um, ended up in uh, the... In, uh, in the, in the reproductive cells of an organism, and then it became a germline mutation, so an inherited mutation. So uh, many mutations, of course, do not have an effect on the phenotype uh, at all, because they are not in, um, in for example, genes, that, that have, and again, they, they do not affect the amino acid sequence of such a gene, but some of them have. And here's an example of a mutation that had an effect on, on the phenotype this is actually a picture from my previous work where I worked in, in flowers, um, where uh, there's an important gene called CCD4A, and that actually turns yellow carotenoids into uh, colorless apocarotenoids. And if that gene is, is mutated, then that conversion does not happen anymore. And then a flower turn, turns yellow. So that's a mutation that has an effect on the phenotype, but many mutations, of course, do not. So what cause uh, mutations? Uh, for example, one cause of that are, are repair mistakes uh, during mitosis, where, uh, for example, there was a breakage in the chromosome and that's repaired, but not completely according uh, to uh, what the, the sequence of that chromosome or that DNA has been before. You can have uh, unbalanced uh, cell division, and often that has bigger effects, of course, on the DNA sequence of cells. So, for example, you can gain or miss entire chromosomes or chromosome arms. Uh, other effect, uh, other causes can be transposable elements. So, transposable elements are also known as as jumping genes. So, these genes they can um, really uh, find different places in, in the genome and, for example, jump uh, into a, a gene that has an effect on the phenotype. And then you also see the effect of, of active transposable elements. The very famous example of uh, transposable elements is, is these, these colored kernels 
example in corn. And of course, uh, these, these causes of mutation, um, they can be, uh, the, the, the occurrence of mutations can be increased by, by different um, uh, environmental effects. So for example, we all know that, for example, UV can cause more mutations and probably because of these effects on, on the repair mistake. So there are two, basically two types of mutations. One of them will be uh, the topic uh, of this course. So that means that a mutation has ended up um, in the reproductive cells of an organism and then that mutation becomes inherited. Um, so of course, that's also how evolution works, right? So that mutations that are uh, um, that, that increase fitness are, are more likely to be inherited to the next generation uh, than, than others. Um, and also we have a mutations, or actually I should say variants, that occur only in a particular part of an organism and do not uh, end up in the reproductive cell. And we call that a, a somatic variation. But of course, somatic variation can also become uh, germline uh, mutations if they end up at some point in the reproductive cells. So I have a question for you. So in, for that, we go to VFOX again. For the new share. There we go. For the people who have uh, just joined, um, you can go to vfox.app and type in the ID over here or scan the little QR code you see on, on the left. So the question is, we look at that uh, mutation in the flower. What kind of mutation has caused the flower to turn yellow? Or actually a better question would be what kind of variant is it actually? Okay, I think most of you have answered. So um, there's a, well, you generally kind of disagree with each other, let's say it like that. Uh, most of you said it's a, it's a germline uh, mutation. Some of you say, say it's somatic, and some of you say, say both. I guess I would agree most with the people who have uh, answered uh, both, because indeed um, it is uh, a mutation that occurred only in a part of the organism. So it is, a, a uh, of course, a somatic uh, variant, because you have parts of, the in, uh, parts of the individual have mutation, other parts of the individual don't. However, it is in the flower, which are the reproductive organs uh, of a plant. So they can be inherited to, to the next generation. So then it has be, uh, can become a germline variant. So I would agree most of the people have said both, but of course, in principle, all answers uh, are correct. Cora has a question. No, I was just curious if like, if it went to the germline, wouldn't it, um, of the plant, right, the reproductive organ, wouldn't it then only be a germline mutation in the next generation? So once that becomes a plant, I'm just Yeah, I guess curious. so. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it depends a bit on, uh, on, on your definition. I guess it's semantics, but... isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but I, I, I agree. That's a, that's a good point because it only, ha only if it is inherited, it becomes germline. You're right. So if this plant would not reproduce, then um, it hasn't been inherited once, so I guess then it's not a German mutation. Right. Okay, back to the presentation. So, some definitions. I think it's important uh, to have some definitions. It might be a little bit boring, but then we uh, know what we have been talking about. So I have been using mutation and, and variants a little bit interchangeably in the in the previous slide, but they 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 are different things, of course. So a mutation would be the change, so that the change has occurred. Um, a variant is uh, something different because that is any difference that exists between any DNA. So that's something that's usually what we measure. So if we measure um, variants, we actually measure something that has occurred after or after the mutations. We're kind of doing forensics over there. So we know if we 
measure variation that it has been caused by mutation, but we are not measuring the actual mutation. Um, then what a lot of people use is, is polymorphism or for example, single nucleotide polymorphism, SNP. And typically, especially in, in human genetics, a, a SNP is uh, some a specific uh, variant or a polymorphism is even a specific variant because that is variation that is common in a population. And typically you're then talking about an allele frequency of more than 1%. So more than 1% of the chromosomes uh, should have that uh, polymorphic uh, allele. Uh, however, uh, variance versus polymorphism can be very problematic, even in human genetics, because it depends very much on the population. So a variance can be a polymorphism in a European population, but not in an African population, for example. So therefore, typically we talk more and more mostly about variants uh, because it is very difficult to define whether something is a polymorphism in this uh, definition, yes or no. Okay, then uh, some concepts that you probably have learned in your Genetics 101 at university, but I think it's nice to uh, just uh, repeat them. Uh, and 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 um, and and uh, you know make sure that everybody's on on the same level. So DNA occurs uh, in a nucleus. Um, if we are talking about diploid, and we'll mainly focus on on diploid during this course, uh, but a lot of the the same concepts hold for for polyploid and a little maybe a little bit to lesser than to haploid because it uh, it's a simpler case. Um, but uh, let's say we have an organism with a nucleus and it has two chromosomes and each, uh, for each chromosome there a pair axis that makes it of course, of course diploid. So we have chromosome one, which is a smaller chromosome with two homologs, in this case A and B, and we have chromosome two with two homologs uh, A and B. And of course, these two homologs, they can pair uh, during meiosis and recombination or crossing over can occur between those homologous uh, chromosomes. Uh, those homologous chromosomes, they have a very similar sequence, uh, but very often not the case. And if there is a difference between them, we call that a heterozygous variant. So that would look like this. So let's say, of course, it's very much enlarged, we have a variant between our two homologs, and we have an allele A and an allele B. So allele A would be, would be the blue one, and allele B would be the, the, the grayish one. So we call that a heterozygous variant because it is different between the two homologous chromosomes. You can also have homozygous uh, variants, uh, depending, of course, on what you call. A, a variant. Uh, so most of the two homologous chromosomes have the same uh, sequence, but um, um, if there is a, a variant that differs between individuals, we can actually say, okay, we have alleles that differ between individuals, and those um, allele, uh, alleles, they can occur both in the two homologous chromosomes, and then call well, that a homozygous uh, variant because it occurs in both of the homologs. Then you can, of course, have many variants, and typically you have, uh, depending on, on the organism, you can have many. So for example, in this flower I worked in, we had variants in every 30 base pairs. In human, I think it's every one, every 10 KB on average. Correct me if I'm wrong, maybe somebody knows that number, but I don't know it by heart. So uh, depends very much on the organism, how many you have. Um, of course, the different types of, um, the different versions of the variants, we call those alleles. So we have two different alleles in the heterozygous variant. We have only one type of allele in the homozygous uh, variant. If we focus on alleles, we can also check uh, whether they occur on the same chromosome, yes or no. So on the same homolog, I would say. They do not occur on the same homolog. We say they, those two alleles, they are in repulsion. If they do occur, uh, so if you focus on these two alleles, 
and we want to see where they are then uh, and if they're on the same chromosome they are in coupling phase so if we pause them in a coupling phase and that can be important if we if we uh, focus on on inheritance because if uh, two alleles are close to each other and in coupling phase it's likely that they inherit together if they are not uh, uh, on so if they're in repulsion phase it is unlikely that they inherit uh, together if we look at blocks that typically inherit uh, together, so uh, are close to each other on the same chromosome, this is of course a little bit enlarged. So we can have, in this case, it's like that we have quite a few recombinations between the alleles, but let's say they are very close uh, together. Then we talk about haplotypes. So haplotypes are a set of alleles that are in coupling space, so on the same chromosome, that are typically inherit as, as one, one block. And haplotypes can be uh, very relevant for all kinds of uh, genetic analyses. That's it regarding those those concepts. Might might have been a little bit quick for some, or for some it might have been okay. Yes, I know that of course because I had this in university. Is, are there any questions regarding this? If not. Then I continue with a question because uh, if there are no questions here, you have understood everything. So let's check whether everybody understood it. So based on this, if two alleles are in repulsion in a single individual, of course, so that means that two alleles are on different chromosomes, can both alleles be inherited by the same individual? So by one child. It's uh, completely anonymous, so if you do not know, that's uh, perfectly fine. You can just uh, give your best, best answer. Okay, hope you have answered. So, okay, that's right. So, most of you uh, are correct, or at least I agree with most of you. Uh, so, the, the answer yes, but only if there is crossing over, but, uh, if there's a crossing over event between the two alleles. So let's go back uh, to the presentation. Wait. There we go. So the repulsion would be this, right? So if we focus on these two alleles, they are in repulsion. And in principle, if there's no crossing over between them, so if there's a crossing over between these two during meiosis, then of course they will not be inherited, uh, especially that occurs. Uh, so it's very unlikely that there is a crossing over uh, between two alleles if the alleles are very close to each other, because that particular place, it needs to be the, the, the crossing over location needs to be at a very specific place in order to have uh, a, um, a crossing over between these, these two alleles. But if they are further away, uh, it's, it's much, much more likely. And then a crossing over can actually cause these two alleles adding up on the same chromosome that is actually inherited by, uh, by the cell. So yes, it's true only if there's a crossing over. Uh, second, um, mostly answered uh, answer is uh, no, because they're on different homologs and only one homolog will in, uh, inherit it. Well, that is, that is true. But you know, if they're crossing over, they, they can still be inherited in the same chromosome. Okay. So basically genetics uh, 101, just a refresher. Uh, so we are all on the same page. So these variants, they are important, uh, I guess, because otherwise you guys wouldn't be here. Um, and therefore it's also important to, to detect them. Um, of course, uh, next generation sequencing hasn't been uh, around uh, since a very long time. Uh, only, well, since the 70s, we were able to, to, to sequence uh, DNA and, and, of course, not, uh, not in a very high throughput. So how did people do that before? Uh, typically through uh, phenotypic analysis. So they saw that phenotypes 
were uh, inherited. So certain characteristics were inherited in a certain way. A uh, very important example is, of course, the experiment that uh, Gregor Mendel uh, did, where um, he came to the conclusion, OK, um, I see variation in these plants, and it inherited uh, somehow. So there must be variation in the inherited uh, material between uh, those plants. So that's already the first evidence for genetic variants. Um, well, uh, a lot of people worked in genetics uh, since then, and, and basically what they worked on was uh, phenotypic analysis. For example, what they also saw is that some phenotypes inherited uh, more often together than others. So you can say something about linkage. So whether two uh, variants were on the same chromosome, for example, but, you know, genetic analysis and, and genetic research really uh, boosted after uh, people could do actual molecular analysis. So actually visualize variants in the DNA. And this started with, uh, for example, ways uh, when PCR was invented to, for example, cut the DNA only at, at places where there was a, was a certain allele and not cut when there, that certain allele wasn't there. So you can could actually... Uh, visualize uh, variant. But of course, uh, nowadays, um, people do not do a lot of variant analysis in that way uh, anymore. If you are interested in variants, what you typically do is next generation uh, sequencing. So you actually sequence the, the DNA and, and do bioinformatics analysis in order to, to detect these, these variants. And that's what this, this course is about. Of course, the big advantage of, of next generation sequencing uh, to, to detect variants is that it's just very, very high throughput. You do not have to run, for example, a single gel for one, one mutation. No, in principle, with a single experiment, which is not too costly anymore, you can actually find and detect all the variants in, in an entire genome. So what kind of variants do we have? Um, well, a very important one, a very, very frequently uh, used one is the single nucleotide variant. It's also the easiest one to work with because it only is a single chain in the I mean, or in the in the nucleotide sequence uh, in the in the DNA. So let's say our our reference, so our reference DNA has as an A and the alternative DNA has as a C over here. I'm sure. All of you have seen a single nucleotide uh, variant before. Then we have the insertion deletion or, or the indel, where um, a part of the DNA sequence exists in one chromosome and do not does not exist in, in the other chromosome. So these are all relatively uh, small. And what they have in common is that they are relatively easy straightforward to detect with next generation sequencing with and with short short reads. Of course, they can also be bigger. Um, a bit of a disadvantage is that uh, these these variants within a uh, population, especially the SNPs or SNP single nucleotide variants, are biallelic, meaning that there are only two alleles, two versions uh, of of uh, um, SNP in the population. However, uh, genetic variation is often multi-allelic, meaning that, for example, um, you uh, if there uh, is uh, you have multiple gene variants, and um, different gene variants can have a different effect on on the phenotype, and that is very difficult to capture with uh, with SNPs, so with these uh, single nucleotide variants. However, what we just have learned is that what we can also look is how alleles are, are phased on a, on a chromosome. So let's say in a population, uh, let's say if we focus on, on two uh, variants and we look at occurrence of combinations of the same phase of those variants in, in a population, and in total, we could find, uh, in theory, four different uh, versions of that. So let's say we have an a T variant, so at the first, and a C C variant. So in, in theory, we can have four different variants there. And then all of a sudden, this variant 
becomes multi-allelic instead of bi-allelic. And that can really increase the power of, of genetic analysis. And let's say that uh, if a, let's say those, those variants are in a single gene, for example, and only if they're both muta mutated, so let's say the reference is CC, but if they're both mutated, so if we are both looking at the minor, uh, minor allele, if it's AT, then that might cause major symptoms in, in a disease. And maybe if you only have the, the, the AT variant um, uh, mutated, you might have, have minor symptoms. And that can have all kinds of implications on, for example, what kind of treatments you will use if you detect these variants and so on. So uh, focusing on these haplotypes can be, can be very, very relevant. And that's also what we will look at uh, during this course. Is the concept of haplotypes uh, clear to you? Because it's quite, quite important. If so, that's great. Because then I have a question. <laughs> and then I'll go back to Vivac again. Okay, so um, if we have uh, three biallelic SNPs or SNVs that are close to each other, the approximate, how many haplotypes can we possibly have in our population? So in order to understand what I mean, I go back to the presentation. So basically we have this. Right, so we have three biallelic uh, SNPs, and um, they occur close together. How many different uh, haplotypes can we have in in a population that occur in a, in a human population or any population? Well, it's, the organism is diploid, though. Okay, I think most of you have answered. We'll stop. There we go. It will be two to the third indeed. So I would agree with most of you. And why is that? Back to slide. So uh, let's say easiest would be the haplotype. So the allele that occur on a single chromosome, which would be A, uh, G, B. But another uh, possibility would be AGT, and then we can have uh, ATT, ATC. So if you know a little bit about um, calculation of chances, you will know it will be two times two times two. So eight different possibilities where we, in which we have these different haplotypes. Is it all clear? Awesome. Great, perfect. And continue. So in addition to short uh, variants that are relatively easy to measure, especially with next generation sequencing, there is also of course large variants and we, we, we know more and more about those when uh, after we are able to, to sequence more genome with uh, long reads uh, and uh, get, get an idea of, of the pan genomic uh, variation. Typical, typically, those uh, variants um, uh, have changes in more than uh, one KB, so more than one, a thousand base pairs. Um, among those is, for example, copy number variation. So a certain sequence occurs more more often or less often uh, in in the genome. Uh, they, they, these can be genes or or, uh, or repeats. Uh, you can have translocation. Uh, meaning that a part of the genome starts up occurring somewhere else. Inversion is that an entire part of the genome is actually inverted uh, on a chromosome. Uh, the, and of course, very big deletions and inversion. In practice, in, in principle, they are not very difficult, different than compared to the indels we can actually measure with next generation sequencing. The only difference is that they are just large. Uh, even bigger can be chromosomal aberration, meaning that uh, some chromosomes uh, occur 
uh, more often uh, than others. A uh, very well-known example is trisomy and chromosome uh, 21 uh, related to, to Down syndrome. And actually, uh, this mutation over here uh, very typically is actually also a chromosomal aberration because this plant that we have seen in the earlier examples is the hexaploid. And that hexaploid plant, um, or especially this cultivar at least, has only one copy of the gene that can convert the yellow into the colorless uh, variant. And if that um, uh, chromosome isn't there anymore, the plant is still completely fine with that, but it just turns out uh, yellow. So <clears throat> to conclude this presentation, uh, in this course, uh, we focus on inherited uh, small variants. We won't be talking about large variants, structural variation uh, a lot, and about detecting them with next generation sequencing. And then we focus mainly on Illumina sequencing, but we, we will, of course, also talk about long read uh, sequencing with, for example, PacBio and Oxford Nanopore technology. So basically what it means is that we um, you have uh, we are in a situation where we have a sequence uh, one or more individuals um, with uh, Illumina. We align those reads to a reference uh, genome. So that is depicted over here. We're trying to find the most probable location of a read uh, at the, the reference uh, genome. And then we look at differences between our reads and the reference genome. And if it occurs very often in our reads, usually we sequence, of course, our genome multiple times. So we have a coverage, certain coverage. Over here we see a coverage, let's say, of about 20 reads. If that uh, mutation occurs multiple times, we say, we, OK, we are confident that this individual actually has uh, that mutation. And then we call that as, as a variant. And we use then that uh, for downstream analysis. So for example, over here, it's very likely we have a variant because all of the reads are different from the reference. They all have a C instead of a T, so probably a homozygous variant because this is a diploid individual. And right next to it, it is very likely we have a heterozygous variant because we have some reads have a T, uh, which is different from the reference, and some reads have a C, that, so they are not depicted in a different color, so they're the same as the reference. Some have a C, so have a T, C, SNP over here, and it's likely to be heterozygous. You can also have insertions and deletions as depicted over here. So then over here, there's a part of the reference that is skipped and a part of uh, the reads that have uh, actually some, something uh, more compared to, to the reference. Um, we will try to detect those, uh, or we will detect those variants with the, the DHK uh, pipeline. Um, so that, of course, uh, starts with uh, aligning reads to a reference genome, also uh, called mapping. Uh, then we do some um, uh, additional um, uh, computations on those, on those alignments to make them ready for uh, uh, variant calling. After that, the actual variant calling takes place. So then you're we're going to look for places that are different uh, from the reference and try to uh, uh, calculate likelihoods on how likely it is an actual variant uh, is there. And at the same time, we also calculate the haplotypes um, and we combine all of the individual uh, variants into a single. Uh, VCF, you probably have heard of the VCF, uh, the variant call format before, and then we filter them uh, based on how likely a variant is, is true, yes or no. And after filtering, uh, we will also continue with a variant annotation uh, in order to see if we have variants in there that might have an effect on, for example, the amino acid sequence in the proteins, and that can, uh, which might, then might have an effect on, on the phenotype. So you will see this image uh, more often, especially at the end of slide, so I can show you where we actually are in this, in this pipeline. So today uh, we will um, align uh, reads. 
um, uh, so we will learn about how alignment works, how alignments are stored, what is a bomb file, for example, and we will try to find duplicates in our reads because usually you want to get rid of the duplicates. And by the way, of course, you will learn later on. All right, this was the presentation.